So good to see everybody here this morning. It is a, uh, a wonderful Lord's Day morning, and we appreciate you for being out with us today. It might be that you are also following along online. Thank you as well uh, for being a part of our service. We hope that we can have you here in person uh, as you have the opportunity to do that. And this is, of course, the uh, a day before Independence Day. Tomorrow will be the day set aside to recognize uh, this nation's independence. I see some red, white, and blue colors as I look out. Uh, also, Brother Larry was kind enough to wear a shade somewhere between Ole Miss red and Tennessee orange. There you go. So we appreciate him for that. But... Uh, uh, you can come back this evening and we will talk a little bit about man's obligation to this great nation and its government, Christian's obligation uh, to its government. And so we'll talk about that this evening, Lord willing. There was a couple that had twins. And uh, the husband was Hispanic, the uh, wife was from the Middle East, and so they wanted to choose names that represented their respective heritage. And so, one of the twins they named Juan, and the, the other twin they named Amal. And as uh, time progressed, the father found himself out with some family, and he wanted to pass out pictures of his children, but he only had pictures of one child. And so he gave them a picture of one of the children, and the family said, we really wish that we could see both twins. And he said, well, if you've seen Juan, you've seen them all." That'll come into play as we talk about our sermon this morning, and you'll see how we can tie that in in just a minute. We're going to talk about a character that, that to me is quite intriguing because he, he has a certain perception that surrounds him uh, in many people's understanding of the New Testament. One of the twelve apostles, his name is Thomas. And as you can tell by the title of the sermon this morning, Thomas and Me, what we're going to try to do is is see what we can glean from Thomas and in so doing what we maybe can learn about ourselves. You see, the name Thomas is the Chaldean word for twin. The word that's the name associated with him in the Greek would be Didymus, which John mentions in his gospel account, which also means twin. Therefore, it's quite likely the case and it's probable that Thomas was a twin. Hence the wonderful bit of humor that began our sermon this morning. As you think about Thomas, we need to recognize that his reputation is connected with the name Doubting Thomas. He's infamously known as Doubting Thomas. And in fact, that's come into common usage. Someone who doesn't believe something or someone who takes a while to come around might be termed a Doubting Thomas. Thomas. And so he is infamous in that regard. But, but is that a fair assessment? And is that all even that we should know about Thomas? Well, we're going to take time this morning to talk about Thomas the Apostle and see what we can learn about him. And we'll notice first of all that Thomas was a man of belonging. And what I mean by that is Thomas is a member of one of the most exclusive groups in the history of the world. Thomas was numbered with the twelve. He was one of the apostles, one of the disciples of Jesus, handpicked by him to help to spread the gospel message in its infancy, to open up the doors of the kingdom, and to represent him after he ascended into heaven. We'll go through some of the various accounts, and we'll begin in Matthew chapter 10. And, and the list is very similar in Matthew 10 and Mark chapter 3 and Luke chapter 6. And so as you look at those three gospel accounts, we'll just take Matthew chapter 10 as representative of those three gospel accounts. It says in verse 2, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Verse 3 says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, scholars for centuries have examined those lists, and there are some similarities among the three lists in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's, uh, it's uh, 
given rise to speculation as to the order of that list. For instance, Simon, Peter, heads the list. Why? Because he's one of the more prominent. He ends up being the spokesperson among the apostles. He's the one given as the example in Acts chapter 2, and so on and so forth. And, and so we see there might be some significance to the way that they're ordered. And if that's the case, it's interesting. Thomas and Matthew are connected in the, the verbiage of each of those lists in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew's account, Thomas comes first and Matthew second, many believe, just as a sign of deference, since Matthew's the one writing and he put himself second. But in the others, it's Matthew first and Thomas, but they are always right next to each other. Did they have a former relationship? Is there some connection? Or were they good friends? Well, we don't really know the answer to that, but I do find that interesting. Another good, interesting side note, I wonder if this was really his name or if this was rather a nickname or a description given to him. After all, his name means twin. If his name is actually Thomas or twin, what did they name the other one? You know, I don't know the, the answer to that. Um, or was it just a nickname given to him as he was coming up or used to describe him? Well, we don't really know that either. Some have speculated that maybe his name was Judas. And since there were already several of those, maybe they just nicknamed him Thomas. There's no biblical uh, info to give us proof as to that. But it's interesting to think about. What was his background? What kind of person was Thomas? We know that Matthew was a publican. We know that Simon was a zealot. We know very many things about a number of the apostles, but we really don't know that much about the background of Thomas. But here is what we know. There's a reason why Jesus chose him. Jesus chose, hand-picked, these men. And while we recognize that Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, and that's described in every one of these <coughs> excuse me, lists, we also need to understand that there must have been something worthwhile seen in Thomas in order for Jesus to have chosen him. If you look at some of those other passages that I have listed on the screen in front of you this morning, we see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, there they are in the upper room after Jesus has died, after He was resurrected, and just before He ascends into heaven, or after He ascends into heaven, and as they are trying to appoint the successor to Judas. Well, who's in that upper room? Thomas is still there. Thomas makes it through all of the circumstances that lead to Acts chapter 1. But even previous to that, in John chapter 20, after Jesus has been resurrected, it is Thomas who is numbered with the others. Now, he's not there the first time in John chapter 20, but they reassemble, it seems, especially for Thomas' benefit so that he can witness and see Jesus firsthand. That means that the other apostles must have cared for Thomas. They must have been interested in his mindset at the time. You go to John chapter 21. And there are gathered some of the apostles, but not all. And while we don't know where all of the apostles are, I believe seven are numbered. And guess who is among that number? Well, Thomas is there. Not only did Jesus choose Thomas, but Thomas remained loyal to Jesus and the twelve. And he's present, for the most part, whenever they are gathered together. And so we see that Jesus chose Thomas, and Thomas recognized his relationship and belonging to both Jesus and the twelve. So there was, number one, a sense of belonging. Thomas was a man of belonging. But number two, Thomas was a man of bravery. If I were to poll the average individual, maybe even the average, the average Christian, the average Bible student, would we know this about Thomas? If we look at John's Gospel account, and John has far more to say about Thomas than any of the other Gospel writers by inspiration in the New Testament. But if we look at John chapter 10 and 11, and we set the stage for what's going on, what we begin to see is danger surrounding Jesus. In John chapter 10, they are prepared to stone Him. He says in verse 30, Jesus does, of John chapter 10, I and my Father are one. 
Then the Jews took up stones again to stone Him. And Jesus discusses the matter with them. He condemns them for their attitude. And then He has to escape. In verse 39, therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hands. In verse 40, he went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. But Jesus, as was customary, decided to return. And as we enter into John chapter 11, he's going to go back to Bethany. Why? Well, because he wants to visit the family of Lazarus, or uh, that would be Mary and Martha. And so he's preparing to go back to to the region of Judea, the place he just left because his life was in danger. So he's going to go back into the lion's den. With that in mind, I want you to notice the interaction between Thomas and Jesus. I want you to pick up in verse 7. Then after that, this is John 11 and verse 7. Then after that, he saith he saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples, verse 8, say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? You see, they, they recognize what we just talked about. You just left a region where your life is in danger. And now you want to go back there again? Who in their right mind would do that? And Jesus answered in verse 9, Are there not twelve hours in the day? That is the daylight. If any man walks in the day, he stumbles not because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walks in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. And these things saith he, and after that he says unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And then his disciples say, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. In verse 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that you may believe. And then he makes this statement, Nevertheless, let us go unto him. So Lazarus is dead. We're going to go back to the place where they tried to stone you. Let us go unto him. You know what the disciples started thinking? Well, He's telling us to go to our deaths. Essentially, Jesus wants us to march back into Judea on a death march and follow Lazarus into the grave. That's what they think. And you can understand why they would think that. So I want you to notice what Thomas says. In verse 16, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with Him. I wonder if there was murmuring amongst the other disciples. I wonder if some of them were questioning whether they were going to follow Jesus back into that place of destruction. And Thomas turned to his fellow disciples and he said, let's go. If he's going to march into death, then we're going to march into death with him. What courage and bravery on the part of Thomas we don't hear that about doubting Thomas, do we? Why isn't he called brave Thomas, courageous Thomas? But all that we ever hear about him is his doubt. But we certainly see courage there on the part of Thomas. So we see number one, belonging. We see number two, bravery. And we see number three, that he was a man of belief. Well, you say, well... I mean, he is doubting Thomas. How can you say that Thomas was a man of belief? Well, let's examine the texts by which we get this idea that Thomas is doubting Thomas. And we go all the way back to John chapter 13. And I want you to notice that in verse 31, Jesus begins to say these words. John 13, 31, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God be glorified in Him, God shall also glorify Him in Himself, and shall straightway glorify Him. Verse 33, Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you shall seek Me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, Jesus says, I'm going somewhere where you can't follow Me. Well, where is that? It's the grave. And then resurrected, and then to heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne of God. 
He's taking a path that they can't follow him on. In verse 36, Simon Peter said, Lord, whither that goest thou? And Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. So Peter questioned that. Jesus, where are you, where are you going? What way are you talking about? And why can't we follow you? And Jesus says, You can't follow me now, but you'll follow me eventually. And certainly that's true. You see, every one of those disciples but John died a martyr's death. They absolutely followed him down the path that he was going. But we recognize this morning that even Peter had questions. Well, the text changes in chapter 14. He begins to be comforting to the disciples. After condemning Peter and saying that you will deny me, in chapter 14 and verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again that I may receive you unto myself. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Jesus has just said in chapter 13, I'm going somewhere where you can't follow me, but you'll follow me later. And Peter said, what are you talking about? And now Jesus is saying, I'm going somewhere, and you know the way. Is it any wonder then that Thomas asks this question? If you look at John chapter 14 and verse 5, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Thomas asks that question. He says, Jesus, I want to know. We don't know your destination, therefore we can't follow you. Once a year, my in-laws draft me to help load straw. And I'm just dumb enough to go out there and help them. I'm also dumb enough that when I drive out to the field to go and help them, a field I'm not familiar with, once dusk falls and it's time to get out, I don't have the faintest clue where I'm going. And of course, they say, well, turn by the big tractor, you know, and, and, follow, and, and head east and you'll get out. And I don't know what in the world they're talking about. So the other night, I get in my vehicle, long afternoon of, of, you know, loading straw, and I have to drive around the field for five or ten minutes to find my way out. I feel like a complete idiot. My sister-in-law calls me on the cell phone as I'm driving through the field. Why? I didn't have a clue where I was going, and I didn't know the way. I felt much like Thomas felt in John chapter 14 and verse 5. But I figured I followed the tree line long enough, I'll hit a road. And that's exactly what happened. Can we understand if we've ever been lost, the feeling of Thomas, especially when someone tries to communicate to you the directions, how to get to a place, and you still can't compute it. Because the references that they're making, you can't understand. And so Jesus is saying all of these things sort of thinly veiled, and Thomas raises his hand as Peter had done just previous and says, Jesus, we don't understand. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Well, we need to understand that that's not a statement of doubt, is it? That's just a, a request for clarification. There are no stupid questions. You've ever heard that? And my father used to say there are no stupid questions, just stupid people. And I don't believe that either. There are no stupid questions. Thomas is asking a legitimate question, a sincere question. And you see, in John 14, we get a clue, I think, that can help us understand, quote-unquote, doubting Thomas. Is Thomas a doubter? Or does Thomas represent the kind of person who seeks clarification and needs confidence in what he believes and what he knows? Well, I think that fits him pretty well. We see it in John chapter 14 and verse 5. Thomas doesn't even ask a follow-up question. Philip does. But Thomas doesn't ask a follow-up. Thomas asks a question. Jesus answers the question. And it seems that Thomas is satisfied with the answer. We can't fault Thomas at all in John 14, can we? I submit to you the very same thing happens in John chapter 20. So I'd like you to turn your Bibles now to John chapter 20. And I want you to take a look at the passage for which uh, Thomas gets this reputation of being doubting Thomas. 
Jesus appears to the disciples in John chapter 20. We pick up beginning there in verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be to you. And when He so said, He showed them His hands and His side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now I want you to notice. How did Jesus convince them that He was who He claimed to be? He showed them His hands and He showed them His side. He gave them evidence. And they believed the evidence. In verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father sent me, even now I send you. And when he would said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sends you remit, they're remitted. Whosoever sends you retain, they're retained. But Thomas, verse 24, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Jesus offered the disciples the evidence that they needed to believe in Him, to, to be convinced of His resurrection. But Thomas wasn't there. He didn't see that. He didn't get the evidence that they did. Therefore, he didn't feel comfortable getting to the conclusion that they did. Verse 25, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a couple of things need to be said. It is absolutely the case that he should have believed the eyewitness testimony of the disciples. Certainly. I mean, you've got a group of men who have proven themselves faithful to Jesus, certainly above Judas Iscariot. And they all claim that Jesus is resurrected. Certainly he should have taken that. But put yourself in Thomas' shoes. They're not asking him to believe some simple thing. They're asking Him to believe that the man they know to be dead is now alive again. And they've all seen the evidence, but He hasn't. We understand that to be the case. Number two, we must say that He did say it awful forcefully, didn't He? I will not believe unless. That's a pretty specific and concise answer that Thomas gave. And I'll give those concessions. But should we be as hard on Thomas as many people have been in the history of Bible scholarship? Well, I don't know that we should. Because as we continue, in verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and and this time Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. I don't know this for certain, but did Jesus do this specifically for Thomas' benefit? I don't know. Then saith he to Thomas, I do know that he calls him out. And he says, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Be not faithless, but believing. Jesus gave him the opportunity to be convinced, to confirm the claims that the disciples made. Did Jesus lead with some big condemnation of Thomas's attitude? Did He say, as He said to Peter when Peter walked on the water and then began to sink because the wind was boisterous and he was afraid, O thou of little faith! Wherefore didst thou doubt? It doesn't seem that he gives a a glaring condemnation of Thomas. And he provides him the opportunity that he seeks. And he says, Be not faithless, but believing. The word faithless there literally means untrusting. And then the word believing is the same root without the negative. Don't be untrusting, but trust. Now why could Thomas now be not untrusting, but trusting? Because he had the evidence that he sought. And here to me is the part we miss the most about Thomas. Maybe we concede that he is doubting Thomas. But when Thomas gets the evidence that he seeks, 
what is his immediate, unquestioned, unwavering response? My Lord and my God. It's been called the single greatest and fullest confession in all of Christianity. With force, he says, My Lord, my God. Can we see the difference between that and what Peter says in Matthew 16? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's true. But Thomas said, My Lord, my anointed, my Christ, my Messiah. Thomas leaves no room for doubt with his immediate response. I find that as telling as anything else. Who is Thomas but a man who wants to be sure? And when he is given the evidence that he needs, he responds immediately with faith. Should we seek to be anything different? than Thomas. I said this sermon this morning as I began was entitled Thomas and Me. So what about you and me this morning? As we've examined Thomas, we have seen those three points. That he was number one, a man of belonging. That he was number two, a man of bravery. That he was number three, a man of belief. You see, those are three of the core requirements that you and I need in order to be faithful to God. But you see, ours happen a little bit differently than they happen for Thomas. Thomas was called, and then he heard the Messiah, and then he experienced all of those things, and his faith grew. And so faith really developed near the end. True faith. Because of the journey that Thomas was on very directly. For us... It's quite different. Our journey starts with faith. And our faith is absolutely based on evidence. There is a good portion of the religious world today that really believes that faith is nothing more than just a leap into the dark. With absolutely no evidence and no certainty It's just, this is what I believe because it's what I feel, and I leap into that abyss with no ability to be certain as to what I believe. And we live in a world riddled with the idea that you can't know truth, that there is nothing absolute. And therefore, so many people don't even bother to find evidence and to really ground what they believe on truth. But we, dear friends, need to be like Thomas. Seek evidence for what we believe. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith and evidence are forever linked to one another. In fact, the very thing that we've been talking about today the interaction with Thomas, the account of Jesus in John's Gospel account, for what purpose was it even written? Go to John chapter 20 again. If you're like me, my Bible's still open there. We just talked about that passage. Look at verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. Why? that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. John says, I'm trying to give you evidence to ground your faith. Faith is not some blind leap in the dark with no foundation of evidence and certainty. Absolutely, there is a sense in which faith is blind. I believe that George Washington absolutely existed. Don't you? Now besides Marion though, how many of you have met him? (laughs) Not a single person has met George Washington, ever laid eyes on the man. And yet we believe with absolute certainty that George Washington existed. Why? Because there's ample evidence to suggest he did. We believe, even though we can't see, because of the evidence that underlies His existence. With God, it's the same. 
with our Savior, it's the same. No, I cannot lay eyes on Jesus right now. No, I can't see God in some physical form. But just as I know based on empirical evidence that George Washington was an actual living, breathing person, I know that Jesus Christ lived and died, rose again, ascended into heaven, that God created the world and gives me the opportunity to be saved. You see, my faith is grounded upon evidence, and yours should be too. But because we are convicted by faith, and because that faith prompts us to act in obedience, we can also have courage. It's hard to defeat someone who believes in what they fight for, isn't it? If I don't believe for the cause for which I'm fighting, I'm going to give up pretty quickly. I'm not going to lay my life down for something I don't believe in. But if I'm truly convicted, if my faith truly rests on evidence, well, it's easy to have courage, isn't it? Bravery and faith are connected. We recognize that we have boldness by faith. Hebrews 10 and verse 19, Ephesians 3 and verse 12. We need to be people of courage. Let me say this morning that if you're a Christian here today and you are struggling with courage to stand up in the face of a wicked world, maybe we need to examine our faith. Maybe that's the problem. Belief, bravery, and dear friends, when we have those things, we have one of the greatest blessings in the history of the world. We have belonging. You see, in Christ are all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, 1 through 3. And one of the greatest blessings that Christians have is the gift of fellowship. In 1 John chapter 1, John describes the Savior, the fact of His death, burial, and resurrection, and says that's the basis for our fellowship that we have in each other and that ultimately we have with Him. What a great blessing to belong to something greater than ourselves, to the church, to the body of Christ. This morning, we need to be like Thomas. Maybe this morning you are here, and just now you believe. And I mean in the true biblical sense of belief. Maybe you're here and you have been convicted by the fact that Jesus Christ came to this earth. The fact that He taught, lived, performed miracles, died through a wicked death, was three days in the tomb, and rose again. Maybe you this morning are convicted by that fact. And maybe this morning you want to respond to your faith, newly convicted. Faith without works, James 2, is dead being alone. If you're here this morning and you have faith, you've got to do something in response to that faith. We are too, as Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, believe and be baptized. And when we do that, we're added to the church. We're placed into His body where we can belong to one another. Maybe this morning, if you're willing to repent of your sins, to confess the name of Christ, my Lord and my God, you can put Him on in baptism and you can be a new creature in Christ. But perhaps this morning you're a Christian and your faith has wavered because it's not really grounded in evidence. Maybe you've forgotten that what we stand upon are facts. True, historically accurate facts about which we can be certain. This morning maybe your faith needs to be restored. Maybe it's sin that has affected your faith. Can we help you to come back to God today? Do you need encouragement and strength? Can we help you? Let us help you now as together we stand and as we sing.